Welcome to uh, our, our podcast, our Cancer Vac CEO Chats. Um, today, I'm joined by Dr. Lara Sullivan. So thank you for being here with me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, just a little bit about your background. Um, Lara graduated from Cornell University with a BA in comparative literature. And I have some questions here because then she jumped into uh, the medical program at uh, the University of Pen Pennsylvania School of Medicine, where she received her doctor of medicine. And if, if that weren't enough, she wanted more schooling and went back and got an MBA from, from Wharton. Um, those are huge accomplishments, uh, all of those. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to come back with a couple of questions for you. But uh, after finishing uh, school, Laura took her first job at Pfizer as a vice president uh, for strategy, portfolio solutions, and worldwide research and development. That is, that's a big title. Um, at a big company. <laughs> That's pretty, <Yes. laughs> pretty awesome. And then several years after she moved into a new role as uh, at Pfizer as the vice president of Pfizer Medical. Um, while at Pfizer, she founded and spun out a company called Springworks Therapeutics. And after Spring, Springworks, she ran a biotech consulting firm and then founded and became president and CEO of Pixis Oncology, a cancer company that's working on uh, tumor cells overcoming immune suppression. How, did I did I get your bio okay? Is there anything you'd like to add there, Lara? So just a thank you. You did a you did a great job. Um, just a few little tweaks, if that's a, if that's okay. So yeah. the um, the I, I made a pit stop after Penn um, in consulting for a few years before yeah. I um, went went to Pfizer um, and uh, and the opportunity at Pixis um, kind of arose out of some of the biotech consulting I was doing um, back in the day that it was founded as a University of Chicago spin out. Oh, um, cool. So the scientific founder is Tom Gajewski from the, uh, it, it, you probably know, was one of the godfathers of immuno-oncology. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, so his lab had kind of conceived of uh, several targets in turning cold tumors hot. Um, so they got some investors, put the company together, and I came in as employee number seven. Um, wow. As we have, uh, yeah, so I was pretty excited about the science and and what the investors were supporting. Um, uh, I guess technically now I'm the most tenured employee because um, several of our early stage scientists have moved on to other discovery stage companies. You know, as we've advanced to the clinic, kind of a natural cadence yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> I sort of feel like I'm the equivalent tenure of Tom since uh, I've now I'm the um, employee who's been there the longest uh, yeah. at this point. But um, but yeah, we'll we'll give Tom the founder credit. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. No, good. Good props for Tom. He's 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 well known in the industry. That's for sure. Yes. Yes, he is. He is. So War, I, a question on Wharton. Wharton, in my mind, I, I think of Wharton as again, I was an HBS uh admittant, I, but dropout. Um, yes. <laughs> and that, that, that's a story for another day. But um, but Wharton's really known for for its finance program. Were, were you, was your MBA more, more general or were you really kind of focused on the finance side of things? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. So you're right. It is obviously very well known in the finance field. Um, there's another sort of maybe less well known competency, but I think equally sort of exciting, and that's their healthcare management program. So oh, sure. um, Wharton, um, I think, did the first MD MBA combined program probably about 50 years or, or so ago. Um, so when I was applying to med schools in the mid 90s, I was um, doing so with an eye towards the med schools that also had great business schools that I could potentially do a combined program. And back in the mid 90s, it was not as common. There were only a handful of schools um, that actually had a formal combined program. Um, so Penn was one of them. I think back then, University of Chicago, Northwestern, I think um, Stanford, um, Harvard didn't have it yet. Columbia didn't have it yet. I don't think Cornell had it yet. So, um, so I was applying to all schools, as you know, you apply to 20 plus med schools because right. you never know where you're going to get in. But I was hoping to have a set to select from that had the business program. And I was fortunate I got into Penn Med. And then after I'd secured the acceptance, I decided to apply to Wharton on top of it. Um, 
because I thought if I knew I was getting into the business school, that would also help me have comfort going to the med school. And, um, and so I, I was admitted, I got the, the admission. So when I showed up for the first day of med school, I knew I was going to be able to go to the business school as part of my overall time in Philly. And, um, and the healthcare, the combined program, I think has about six students every year that do it. And then they also um, bring a lot of MDs or PhDs from other med schools, um, you know, who don't have business schools come in and, and get the Wharton MBA with a quote healthcare management major. And then there's a whole bunch of people who just love healthcare who are not MDs or PhDs, but typical MBA students that want to focus on healthcare as yeah. it's as the industry of choice. Well, that's fascinating. So you, so you did those degrees concurrently then? I did. Essentially, it's a five-year program. Sure. And kind of so like they the like, MBA sort of a thing. Yeah, exactly. So they yeah. sort of cross count one semester of electives from each school. Sure. So you lose a little bit of elective time, but you save a year of tuition expense and time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and what's interesting is for the MD MBAs, every year, um, it's tended to split almost 50-50 those who decide to go go um, go on in medicine and, and do a residency yeah. versus those yeah. like me who after the exposure to both say, oh, my value adds more on the business side. And that's, but, ha- that's really what happened to me. Yeah. And that was my <laughs> next question for you, Lara, is yeah. as you, as you went into medical school and then also doing your MBA, were you more focused on, on, on practicing medicine at some point, or were you more focused on using the understand, you know, the knowledge of the medical degree and, 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 you know, going into the business world? Yeah. So for me, so I, I come from a medical family, both mom and dad were practicing physicians and, okay. Um, they both trained in Columbia in New York city, um, where I was born. And then we ended up in upstate New York in the finger lakes because the public health service paid for dad's med school. Um, and myself and my brothers were around when they went to med school. So it was a you know, pretty big expense for somebody with a family. Yeah. And so my model of medicine was always the clinical practice of it, especially in a rural environment where that style of medicine is, you know, you know, not just your patient, but your patient's families because you're part of the community. So when I decided to go to med school, that was my model. And my intent was to, um, practice medicine, yeah. um, I had did had. A, did you have a particular area of focus that you were interested in? Yeah, so I really was intrigued by psychiatry and adolescent medicine, um, yeah. and so I focused my med school electives in those areas. Uh-huh. Um, you know, because I I I loved the idea, sort of, of the adolescent um, age group being, you know, sort of still very malleable and shapeable to in- interventions that you can help, especially, you know, in mental health issues. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that was really my, my interest and my intent. Um, I had after college before med school, I'd worked um, in business for just a couple of years as one of those sort of banking analyst jobs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'd had a little taste of business, um, which was enough for me to think, Hmm, maybe if I got an MBA, I could be helpful as a practicing physician in the health system. And then what happened was when I was on the Wharton side of things, I saw all these MDs and PhDs doing, you know, incredible jobs in the industry that I had no idea existed. I, I mean, I didn't know what venture capital was. I didn't know what an SVP of business development at J&J was, you know, and that they'd have like a PhD typically or, and all of a sudden I saw all those kinds of jobs and, and, and role models that was very different than practicing rural community medicine. Um, And by the time I finished the combined program, I felt that my skills and interests were probably better suited to the business application than the actual clinical practice of medicine. But you know, it was a dilemma really up until the the end, because, you know, I remember thinking, well, if I end up in business, I really shouldn't do a residency because then it's a waste of system resources and time on somebody who's, you know, because t- you know, residencies are what three quarters subsidized by the government, essentially, or the, the university. So to get trained and then opt out of the system didn't seem appropriate if I really had the impulse that I would be ending up on the business side. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, one of the follow-up questions that I had that you've sort of already answered because your your education was really fo- focused in in the on the East Coast in the kind yeah. of New England ish area, right? Yeah. And so, so I was my question was, did you grow up, you know, in that area? And you you grew up in New York and up upstate New York, huh? 
Yeah, absolutely. There was a small pit stop in New Jersey, um, suburban New Jersey. We sort of went urban near Manhattan to suburban New Jersey to rural upstate New York. Um, so I really had the taste of all three yeah. kinds of communities of living. Um, and I, I think when I think of my childhood, mostly I identify with rural upstate New York because, yeah. you know, that was just a very formative community and just looking back such a wonderful place to grow up because you know small town america mm -hmm. at least back then people really looked out for one another and so you had a true community that kind of looked out for kids and older people and everyone in between you, you, you know you don't always have that in places like manhattan or suburban suburbs so oh, it's a different type of community isn't it yes it is it is it is what were you interested in as as a, a young girl growing up what were your hobbies and interests Laura yeah so I as a kid you know in addition to kind of coming from a medical family um we were a fairly athletic family my brothers are all into sports I was into yeah. sports so you know I played volleyball in high school and yeah. I loved you know skiing and swimming and you know, water skiing and as a real young kid was gymnastics until I got too tall for that. <laughs> you have to be really a little petite yeah. person. Yeah. Um, and um, so, and, and that kind of place, you know, in, in rural upstate sports is really the name of the game. Um, we're probably one of the few communities where it was not cool to be a cheerleader. You know, if you were a girl, it was cool to be an athlete, not a cheerleader. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you were a cheerleader, it meant you probably weren't athletic enough yeah. to make any team. So, right. so, you know, it was very much a very pro female sports town, which I yeah. think is also great for young girls. And, um, yeah, so I, I was really fortunate to to have that. Really yeah. quite fortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are those childhood dreams are. I as a kid, I was convinced I was going to be a major league baseball player, and, yeah. and someday I would retire, and then uh, following in my grandfather's footsteps, become an entrepreneur and start start a bunch of companies. And that was sort of my trajectory. You know. Yep. <laughs> Did you ever have the childhood dream of coming? Uh, you know, going through the system and becoming a doctor or going to medical school? Yeah, so it's funny you ask because it was almost like it was almost the opposite because you know in our when we moved to upstate New York for my dad's obligation to the public health service, yeah. you know the small town newspaper had a headline: two doctors moved to town because you know <laughs> my mom was also coming. Yeah, it's <laughs> and that, that kind of a town, that's cool. Yeah. It was that kind of a town, and so everyone was always like, "Are you going to be a doctor like your mom and dad? Are you going to be a doctor like your mom and dad?" And I don't know about you, but I sort of felt oppositional and I'm like, I'm going to be yeah. my own person. Yeah. And so, no, I'm not doing med school. Um, and what happened was I, I, I did always have the interest in science. And so, you know, I loved chemistry in high school. I loved it. And so when I went to college, my intention was to do like a dual science and English major. Um, and I wanted chemistry and English. And um, because I also loved reading and literature and I, I couldn't, I wasn't the natural person in one or the other. I was kind of good enough. And if I worked hard, I could hang with sure, those yeah, naturally yeah. talented people. And so I thought, well, I don't have to pick one. I can go to college and do both. And so I went through sort of the first two years of foundational science classes um, and did fine and, and, and well, and then it hits like physical chemistry. And I'm thinking, wait a second, who <laughs> wants to put themselves through this torture yeah, unless right. they want to yeah. be a chem, an actual chemist. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, that I, I didn't see myself as a, as a researcher. Yeah. So I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to sort of pause the science. Mm -hmm. Um, I take an advanced math as well. So I had that. And then I fell in love. I took a comparative literature class as an elective from the English major and all of a sudden I realized, wait, literature is beyond bigger than American and British, which, you know, is what English tends to yeah. shore you to. And all of a sudden We're you're reading myopic, Caribbean. aren't we? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, you know, I had this Caribbean literature and, and oh, you know, Spanish literature and all these other cultures. And so I said, oh, this is really interesting. And, and back then. I mean, today I still, I, I'm a very strong believer in the liberal arts as a great way to train critical thinking. So I felt comfortable taking a major that maybe was quote, less useful. I know people tend to these days say, you know, how are you going to get a job if you're a philosophy major or, or an English major? <laughs> and maybe it's harder these days to do that. But my experience was, it was, it was fine. I didn't feel disadvantaged in the job market back then. And I, 
I feel like I benefit from that training even today and how I read documents and, sure. and think about things. So that was sort of how the comparative literature snuck in. And, and the pre-med was in the background, although I didn't know it was pre-med at the time. It, that kind of came up um, after college where I started volunteering at Bellevue Hospital because I'd moved down to New York City um, for my first job after college. And, and I said, well, wait a second, there's something to this practice of medicine. And I was so dismissive of being oppositional to mom and dad <laughs> that once I was away from that environment and able to think on my own, I thought, oh, med medicine has a lot to offer. So let me give that a, a go. That's really, you know, I, my, I have an uncle who is a, has a JD MBA from Harvard. Yeah. And, uh, and as I was in my early years in college, I remember asking him, I just said, listen, my goal, I want to go to business school. That's ultimately where, where I want to go. And yeah. And, and, and then kind of branch out from there. And what, what's the best major I asked right. him, what's the best major in order to, you know, enhance my chances of getting into a good school. And he said, listen, most of the business schools see, uh, finance and economics yeah. and, you know, majors or business management majors. Sometimes they'll see an engineering major. He goes, so just do what you like. And, uh, yeah. and if it's something other than that, I mean, take those, those fundamental core classes, right. Cause you need those accounting yeah. economics and such, but, um, but do something that you really like. And that, that might actually set you apart. So I'd be, I was a political science major. <laughs> See, I love that. Exactly. I mean, we have a, we're interviewing somebody for one of our board seats right now who was a philosophy undergrad. And I think he has a master's in philosophy and he's a, he's a, an MD and a renowned researcher. And I bet he's a brilliant so thinker. Yeah. I can't wait yeah. to continue the process and hopefully yeah. we'll, we'll have him join our board eventually. But um, you know, it's, I think those critical thinking skills that these disciplines teach you are just so valuable, especially in our field, because I often think of what scientists do. Actually, I think of it as art because yeah, really I think, is. right, it's so creative. It and really so, yeah. you know, everyone, the lay person thinks of what biotech, you know, data and analysis and, yeah. and, and beakers and chemicals. And, and it is know, that. And but it is that. So much more. Yeah. Exactly. And so you, yeah. you realize there's a creativity at play. And so, you know, I love, I love when we have those sort of two sides of the brain, you yeah. know, at work. And you and really see that in the discovery phase, I find almost more than anything else. I mean, that cre yeah. creativity that comes in, how do we do this, right? How do we, Yeah. You, you almost start with a problem in mind and then kind of work backwards, but it's, it really is a creative process. It's fun to watch. It really is. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it's fascinating because I think when you invite people to be creative and you give permission and re like recognition and space and reward yeah. for yeah. thinking in an unconstrained way, um, you get amazing things and amazing ideas from all pockets. Like even in Pixis, we do a lot of brainstorming holistically around like trial design. And so we'll have ideas around positioning or ways to think about um uh, differentiation versus competitors that come from finance or come from our, you know, analytical person. Yeah. And I love that because sometimes somebody seeing the same question from a different discipline opens up a whole new idea or outcome. And then the subject matter experts can riff on it and take it to the next level. Um, but I love, the, I love that you just said that. I mean, because that, I mean, that really, truly resonates with me as a, again, as a business guy with not without mm -hmm. I, I joke with my scientists that I I'm a scientist also, right? But I'm a yeah. scientist. But <laughs> yeah, it counts, right? <laughs> it kind, kind of, I guess. But <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but, it, but it's interesting because I remember when. So I I ended up in the venture capital space, and and then um, we licensed a, 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 an asset from a university. Um, it was completely outside of our investment thesis, but we did it, and I ended up as the CEO. It was supposed to be an interim position. Uh, mm -hmm. CEO of, of an antibiotics company and uh, ended up staying there for seven years and fell in wow. love with the biotech space. And I've, I'm, I've been there ever since. But, um, but, but what I found interesting was that I didn't understand the normal way to build a biotech company um, because yeah. I looked at the world differently than most of the biotech com you know, you know, early biotech yeah. companies did. And I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And, and I think that we, we built it in such an unconventional way um, because we were 
we were ignorant, really, <laughs> you know. And, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, but but it actually ended up being a real strength to be able to think and look at a at, at how to solve a drug development and a discovery program differently than than is normally done, you know, not the textbook way. So I love that you're thinking in those terms. That really that resonates with me. Well, it's funny because you know what your story there is very similar to my experience in um, uh, founding and spinning out Springworks Therapeutics from Pfizer. Because yeah. you know, I mean, as you know, the the playbook tends to be university based innovation. Yep. You know, put a put some money and a team around it and go. And obviously, assets are are out licensed from big co companies all the time. Yeah. Um, but as a sort of in point of entry into biotech as a new leader. Um, I, I was similarly like you at the time when 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 I did that, I went over as president. We had an executive chair president combo. Um, I would I wasn't doing it the playbook way either. And I I, I like to think of it as naivete rather than ignorance. It, it, yes, yes. <laughs> like I, I prefer that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you're right. I think I look back now that I'm more experienced, I think back to some of the things I said and did and thought. <laughs> with all sort of confidence of the naive. And I'm like, wow, I'm glad that investor didn't, you know, spank me too hard in that meeting. And they actually yeah. listened to what I was saying, yeah. probably because of that kind of inquisitiveness. So. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it's, you're right. Yeah. So did you, did you go right from uh, Wharton and med school into Pfizer? Were, 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 were there roles in between or because there I mean, was, going roles from in between. Okay, yes. as I'm saying, yes. just like jumping from from grad school into a vice president position at Pfizer is a pretty, pretty yeah, big deal. yeah. No, that I think that would only happen for people maybe who'd been sure. in Pfizer or places like that before, and then went to business school and came back. I did a pit stop at McKinsey um, oh, for yeah, for yeah. several yeah. years. Oh, great. Yeah, were you, and were that, you focused at McKinsey? Were you focused on more of the healthcare side of things? Exactly. So I was part yeah. of the, they called it the pharma and medical products practice. Sure. So it was a lot yeah. of big pharma clients. And then um, I had a few little biotechs and a few little medical device clients. And um, for me, I, I think of McKinsey or even consulting in general is almost like the postdoc to your MBA. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because it's right, you learn all this theory about business and business school. And then consulting firms are great opportunities to see the business problems play out. And you often see the same business problem in different settings. So you see how they play out differently. And um, I found it to be an incredible like educational experience. Um, and so I was there for several years and I was able to work on some of the, like the big industry mergers that were going on in the late 2000s. Um, was that, yeah, late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, and, um, and, and, and my, uh, Wyeth had been a big client of mine in the R and D space, um, back then. And when it was acquired by Pfizer, um, several of the executives I worked with said, um, they, they created a new strategy and come on over. Are you ready to do quote real work was the quote. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, I, and then when I got to the other side, I understood why they said that because, you know, as, as, as amazing as that consulting work is from an educational perspective, once you're inside a company, big or small, you realize your view as an inside operator is so much more expansive yeah. than what you can yeah. ever see as a, as an advisor. Yeah. Um, and so it was really fun. And, and, and I was so privileged to be able to, to t make my first leap into an operating role, working with executives that I had a relationship with already um, because several of them were there after the acquisition of Wyeth. And so yeah. I actually think my time at Pfizer was an incredible biotech CEO training. And I didn't even know it at the time because I was in the heart of the innovation engine of what was at that time, the world's biggest pharma company. And, and they were reinventing their R and D approach. So, you know, more efficient processes, but also more emphasis on innovation because Pfizer's, you know, always has a reputation from its commercial prowess and marketing. Yeah. So I really was there at a time that was incredible for, for the, for the Pfizer business, but also for those of us who were working in it at the time, an incredible learning experience um, that I draw on every day. You know, I find myself saying things sometimes to the team that I remember Michael Dolston was saying to, you know, his teams 
And I didn't know it at the time that, you know, 10 years later, I'd be channeling, you know, Michael Dolston, who's still very successful, still the head of R&D over there at Pfizer 10 years later. Yeah. Well, what a great opportunity for you. I mean, one of the uh, definitely the largest uh, pharma in the, in the country, in, in the United States, and, and certainly one of the largest yeah. in the world, like over $100 billion in revenue annually. I mean, oh, yeah. Massive. It's 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 massive. It's massive. Yeah. I just, kind uh, of mind just, Yeah. I just recently interviewed the former associate general counsel at Pfizer, a guy named Stephen oh. Diamond, who's, who's a good friend. Oh, nice. And so I want to hear more great. about this. That you're, you're, so you had two different roles at Pfizer. Walk me through those two different roles. I mean, that that had to have been, I mean, you talked a little bit about it, but uh, yeah. what a huge learning opportunity for you. It was really, I, 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 I feel like I got, I don't know, 10 or 15 years of learning and experience jam-packed into like a six-year time frame at Pfizer because I had such a diversity of things I was able to, to work on and be exposed to. So when I first came over, it was in the role as um, a portfolio and strategy head for the R&D organization. So that meant I worked with all the chief scientific officers in all the therapeutic areas on their strategies and budgets for discovery through phase two. Yeah. So I, I had 13 CSOs at the time and it's almost like 13 little biotechs, right? In, in a lot Absolutely. of ways. Yeah. Um, I'm and- just curious, what is a typical budget for uh, a discovery program at a company like Pfizer. I can tell oh. you what it is for a startup company like- Yeah, like you know, <laughs> I, I think of it, it's funny you say that because I think of it at the macro level. Like I remember distinctly back then we had 2.7 billion for our budget to cover the totality of discovery through phase two. And even that is not enough. There's always more budget demand than dollars available, which is great. Again, mind boggling to people like you and me sitting in our small company seats today what we could well, do until you, really, until you really look at what it costs to get through clinical trials and all of right. that, then you start to realize it. Exactly. And then the other half of the budget was probably another six billion or so was sort of the phase two and beyond. Phase two B and beyond. Exactly. And then there was a whole commercial marketing budget. So I had portfolio two phase two. There was another portfolio person kind of phase two B and beyond. And then there were the commercial portfolio people. And we all sort of worked together. Um in our, in our various spaces. So we, you know, I, I just, I, I, it was a tremendous experience because I was sort of the first business person in that role. It was a newly created role. Pfizer hadn't had a role like that in about a decade. And so coming after the acquisition of Wyatt, there was a real need to have, um, a strategy on how you're going to spend across all these programs, even though there was budget for 300 programs a year, there were still 400 programs that wanted budget. So we needed to figure something out. And, um, and so I, with my kind of my, my MD and MBA background, and then my work at McKinsey was had, had the right sort of mix of experiences to come into this role. And from my vantage point, it was the opportunity to practice all those things I'd learned in real life with point accountability. Um, And so I, you know, there was a little transition period at the beginning where the scientists had to get used to a business person in their mix. (laughs) They were very suspicious of me at first. I understand. Yeah. What are you here to do? And (laughs) why should we let you in? And and we had a few moments at the very beginning where, you know, I I remember leaving meetings thinking, oh, they're they're never going to trust me. And and how am I going to build this relationship? And, and we had a few kind of real bonding moments that where that that finally happened and one of the takeaways out of that was you know i said look i'm i'm the ambassador for you like you need to think of yeah like i need if we work together i can represent your science to the rest of the corporation and help you compete for budget with everything else that's going on out there i'm your friend i'm not your enemy as a corporate person i'm your advocate and as they saw that, then we became very well integrated. Um, so, and and from my vantage point, like having thirteen chief scientific officers at once, it was like it was like a contr- like a randomized clinical trial in the sense I could see things play out differently, <laughs> the same thing play out differently, and then had like exponential learnings. And um, you know, several of those people are good friends today. Um, so it was really a wonderful, wonderful learning experience. It was. Well, I had a similar experience, not on the same level as Pfizer, Laura, mind you, but um, as I started working with with teams of of PhDs, you know, scientists, and and I was the the 
the, the, the suspicious one in the room. And, and yeah. I learned that, especially because I didn't have a science background. I mean, you've got a huge leg up on me with, a, with you know, a, 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 an MD. But um, I learned, though, that um, every business needs a business person. It, yes. right? it doesn't really matter Absolutely. what business it is, whether it's in the pharma space or in the high tech space, you got to have someone focused on the business. And and as soon as, as uh, the scientists realized, hey, we get to still head down, focus on the science, but we need someone to take it from here out. And, exactly. uh, and, and once they understood that, I, I'm also kind of reminded, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a kind of a comedy movie called Office Space. Oh, it, yeah, yeah. Um, it's great. They bring these consultants in called The Bob. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I always felt like that as I would come into a new biotech and they'd look at me like I'm one of the bobs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. See, I really was a bob. <laughs> I know you for were. A while. Mackenzie, you were a bob. That's I was what, a bob. what prompted that memory for me. So, um, <laughs> yes. So, at some point at Pfizer, you found uh, either a, 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 an asset that wasn't moving forward that was deprioritized or something that caught your interest. And, yes. and that's what led to, uh, to Springworks, right? Correct. Yeah. So I did four years leading the portfolio group and, you know, tremendous learning and fun and, and I think business impact in, in sort of helping build that muscle in Pfizer. And you're, you're right. In the course of that work, I saw a number of great assets that had, you know, great clinical data that were put on the shelf because they didn't fit either the corporate strategies or they didn't have a revenue return that Pfizer needed to have to justify its own internal use of capital. And so, um, you know, I kind of saw these as, as many others in big companies, you know, we all see this dynamic. Um, but what was different at this moment in time was one of these assets that was on the shelf was still go undergoing an investigator initiated trial down at the NIH in a rare disease, a rare oncology disease. Yeah. And those patients were showing significant benefit in that phase, phase two investigator initiated trial. Meanwhile, it was on the shelf at Pfizer because it had failed the larger indications. Mm -hmm. And so the patients started calling saying, hey, what's gonna happen when we run out of supply? Um, and on the Pfizer side, um, Frida Lewis Hall, who was the chief medical officer of Pfizer at the time and now is on my Pixis board, was equally committed to supporting patient needs, kind of obviously aligned with corporate priorities, but also agnostic to corporate priorities. And so she saw a benefit of trying to figure a solution out to these patients. I knew the asset um, intimately because of my portfolio work and I believed in it. And so Frida and I started talking and she said, why don't you come over and work for me on secondment from your day job? Um, dedicate yourself to just figuring out a solution for this. Like we didn't come, we didn't know when we started working together, it was going to end up as a spin out. Yeah. We just knew there was an exciting asset that didn't have budget at Pfizer that had, you know, emerging clinical utility and a patient or a, a motivated patient group that really needed that medicine. How and that, that, patient base, that, that trial. Um, it was, there were 17 patients in the trial and they yeah. called themselves the lucky 17 That's cool. yeah. <laughs> because they were all seeing, you know, they were seeing benefit and, yeah. and, you know, they all knew each other since it was investigator trial. They, it was a kind of patient community that, you know, was patients were well known and, and, and communicated with one another. And so they were sort of kind of coming together saying, Hey, is there anything Pfizer can do to help us here? Like, you know, we'll pay for the medicine. Like they were coming up from their angle with ways to address the problem, which as those of us in the industry know, it's unfortunately not that simple as a patient showing up and saying, I'll, I'll write you a $10 million check. Give me the asset off your shelf. It doesn't work that way. Um, but they were, they were trying to come up with solutions. I knew the asset. Frida knew the patient community. And it just was a, a, a symbiotic opportunity to, for me to come over, step out of my day job, work with Frida and, and then the patient group to say, hey, let's figure out a way to address this. Yeah. And so um, I went over, when I went over to Frida, I didn't have any direct reports anymore. I was just working on this. And um, was, was, the, was, was the focus, was there a specific focus in the oncology space at, at Springworks? I know, so, I know originally the clinical trial was, was more of a rare disease, right? Correct. So originally, the orphan, yeah. the orphan, yeah. So originally what happened was that asset, that gamma secretase inhibitor for the desmoid patient population, which is their lead asset now, um, that was the catalyst for this concept of, hey, 
Is there a way we can help get this asset off the shelf so we can get the, get it in the hands of, of capital that's more appropriate for a patient group this size? And then by the way, there's other assets on the shelf in Pfizer that have a similar profile. So maybe we should take those too. Yeah. Yeah. And so Springworks first started out with four, four clinical assets in four distinct therapeutic areas. And the common theme was not therapeutic area focus so much as it was underserved patient populations. And we had a rare oncology asset. We had a rare disease asset. We had a rare, maybe more underserved is the better way to say it, um, neuroscience asset. And then we had a, um, um, a, um, a rare um, hematology asset. Yeah. And so those four all came over and formed the, the founding pipeline of Springworks. Um, and that was, again, driven by the the problem we were trying to solve from the inside of Pfizer, which was let's shake out assets that have, you know, we believe have clinical utility for underserved patient populations. And the best That's way to you do need that. To start a company with four clinical assets, right? On my side of the fence, we start the we start a biotech with, with some crazy idea. It was very unusual. You know, and to your cool. earlier yeah, thank you. To your earlier point, I think that was the naivete that maybe both Frida and I had in the sense of what do you mean you can't start a company with four clinical assets, right? What do you mean they can four they have to be, clinical assets? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What do you mean they have to be in the same theme of therapy area or modality? Like we didn't I, I think it's very fair to say, I'll speak for her too for a moment, because I I I I felt this. I don't think we appreciated the investor narrative that tends to like to see things in similar therapeutic areas and mechanisms, we just grabbed what we knew from the patient experience needed yeah. support and they weren't necessarily linked in an investment thesis way. So that's, right. that's one of the things, right, that translated differently once the assets came out of Pfizer. And it's one of the things I described to the naivete or the ignorance that you mentioned earlier, because at the time we just, you know, oh, this is data, great data. It's going to get. No, funded. I mean, normal investor, <laughs> like, who are you? Like, what is your, yeah. focus? like, we want to, we yeah. want to invest on like one thing and you've got four. Yeah, you're right. And I think in retrospect, now I look back, there were plenty of conversations that, you know, that was sort of the outcome, even though they weren't as direct in telling us that was the reason. Um, and, you know, we eventually, because the rare disease and the rare oncology disease kind of aggregated together, those two assets, um, Bain and Orbimed stepped in as the series A investors, and that finally got the the ball rolling. And then the leadership team you know, that runs it today, you know, came on pretty early as well. And, and I think they were um, seasoned in how investors see things and, and decided to focus the pipeline and the story in that direction, which they really had to do um, to yeah, create that fantastic. identity. Those are and great. I, I know Orbimed well. They're, I mean, yeah. they're obviously as reputable as they come in the biotech investment space. And, and, and I love that Bain's, Bain's in there now, right? They've got their- oh, yeah science group and and my uncle actually was the founder of Bain Capital. Oh really? Yeah. Oh that's super exciting. Yeah the Bain guys were great. I mean they, you know, and and I think when we first engaged with them, um they were so they they were just getting that um the healthcare group sort of was at a at a real growth trajectory. So the Springworks investment was one of the early investments for that group of investors that are there today. And so I think it 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 provided some great um, you know seed corn for lack of a better term as they kind of continued to build the practice and of course today they're you know huge hugely dominant lots of capital and and so forth and they they even went down to one of the patient meetings while we were building the company while it was still That's inside great. yeah while it was still captive inside Pfizer um, we were doing a lot of work with the patient communities and I remember I kept telling the patients don't worry don't worry we're talking to investors there's capital. And then we had them come down and show up at a meeting. And I, I remember I was speaking to the patient community. I pointed at them. I said, see those guys in suits over there? <laughs> That's the capital I'm talking about. <laughs> and, then, and then the patients were all reassured. Yes, something is happening. <laughs> That's a good story. So you went from Springworks then into a more back to your consulting roots for a time before going back into the biotech. And, and I was really intrigued as I looked at your sort of your bio and your resume on the consulting side, you know, helping yeah. companies raise money. Of course, that's uh, that's that everyone needs that, right? But but it also appears as though you really work closely with it, uh, 
at least one university on, on helping them set up a biotech incubator. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah. So what happened was um, when I, so I, I spent two years building Springworks while a Pfizer employee, and then a year building it, you know, and continuing to scale it um, as a Springworks employee um, once it popped out of Pfizer. And um, I ended up, you know, I, I ended up leaving and taking a sabbatical from the industry for about a year or so. Uh, my mother was ill and my, uh, my dad needed some caregiving support. And, um, you know, she had, she was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And so time was obviously very precious. Um, and once, you know, Springworks was kind of out, set up, we had, you know, board in place, management team, et cetera, et cetera. It, it was, it was comfortable to me that, you know, the, 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 the team that was in place was going to continue to drive it. Um, so I stepped out and I, I literally really did focus on family. Um, and as my mom and the situation kind of stabilized, I was sort of left with the question of, wait, am I now a biotech entrepreneur or am I still a pharma person? Like, what am I? You know, um, and and so I I started doing consulting to really test the waters on the true biotech entrepreneur, the classic playbook to our earlier point, because I hadn't experienced that. I had experienced a corporate spin out from a large company. And this was at the advice of Dan Lynch, who was the executive chair at Springworks. You know, he said, look, when you're thinking about your next thing, he said, there's so many different subtypes of investors with different investment theses. There's different ways of like playing in the biotech space. You, He said, you need to get exposed to those before you kind of make your next um, move. Or he's advised me to do that. And I thought it was really sound. And so I said, okay, well, let me just start leveraging my network and sort of finding ways to take on some, you know, more interim roles or opportunities to be exposed to things without necessarily fully committing as a C-level or a full-time job until I, until I know myself better and the ecosystem better of where I want to be. And so it played out in a, in a number of ways. Um, you know, I worked with a hedge fund that was looking to a non-healthcare hedge fund that was looking to set up um, it's like a biotech investment with assets coming from universities. In this case, it was New York City based universities. Um, and that was interesting. It, we, I spent several months doing that with um, an operational guy who's um, well known in the New York City biotech circles. So we were kind of partnering together to do it. And eventually, you know, that one we didn't take forward because once those non-healthcare investors really understood the capital intensity of healthcare, <laughs> they said, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and it's not a three to five year term, is it? <laughs> no. Yeah. And, um, and and they said, what do you mean you need tens of millions of dollars eventually? Well, that's what you do. So, um, and then similarly, there was a, a university in upstate New York that was looking to build out its... Um, tech transfer and, you know, make its mark reputationally on spinning IP and new companies out of the university. Um, and so I did a little bit of advisory work um, with them, you know, on the concept and how to set it up and, and that sort of thing. And when it came time to, you know, to thinking about a full-time role doing that, um, again, I wasn't really ready to do that from the academic side um, because the way that and maybe most of them are like this. I, I do think it's probably challenging in general sometimes for tech trans the tech transfer space in universities, right? Because you're doing sort of the same thing in a lot of ways as what entrepreneurs are doing, but you're capped and limited by university requirements. Um, so that sort of natural tension felt a little difficult to navigate. And so I said, okay, um, let me also kind of focus on um, the operating side of university spinouts. So I went and did some work as an acting CEO for a spinout from Duke. Um, it was an exciting um, uh, te preclinical technology in the radio chem space uh, in oncology. Um, they had great molecule, great data, amazing founder and scientists. And um, you know, I did the the business plan. I raised the seed the seed round with them with a well known investor. You know, it was a great ex entrepreneurial experience. Yeah. And um, what I found in that case was it was so early that the scientific founders had still so much control that while they were listening to the business guidance, not enough for me to feel comfortable to go forward in a full-time role with them. Um, 
And so I said, okay, then probably now that I've had all these experiences, probably the best space is those companies where they do already have a seed or a series A with some knowledgeable investors who've kind of dealt with those issues Already. of getting the tech transferred out. Yeah. And the scientific founder um, in it optimized for where they add the most value. And then I can come in and help drive it. And that's what picks is sort of fit. That's fantastic. It, one of the, yeah. the recent uh, interviews I did was with a guy named David, Dr. David Beers, who Mm -hmm. um, started and sold two cancer companies and, and then also helped set up a, an incu a biotech incubator at the University of Utah, adjacent yeah. to the Huntsman Cancer Center. And so, and, and I've liked it at, at uh, CancerVax, we we're, I mean, that's our model. We've, we have two sponsored research agreements with UCLA mm -hmm. and, I, and I really do like that model a lot. There's so many good ideas that are birthed in, you know, from academia and, oh, yeah. Uh, they just don't know what to do with it. They're not equipped and or, or nor do they have the funding uh, to really un to understand how to take those ideas out, develop yeah. them and then get them to the commercial space. And so I'm, I'm yeah. super interested that, that you did it, but on, on to Pixis now. So this is where you yeah. are. So yes. uh, tell me about this, this cool company of yours. So we um, we started out as um, immuno, immuno oncology focused with Tom's founding IP and um, you know, he did a great job with his, his um, you know, cold to hot tumor models, a number of targets that we got. Um, our founding investors were Longwood Fund, um, uh, Bayer, Agent Capital, and Ipsen. So two corporates and two VCs. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was a modest Series A back then. That was 2019, summer of 2019, the company launched. And what I really loved about Actually, it- Actually, your timing was pretty good. Had it been yeah. summer of 2020? Maybe you yeah. that we'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it really was fortunate. Um, I, you know, what I loved about it with Longwood in particular as one of the founders. So Tom was a founder. Was um, it Longwood out of Boston? Longwood's out of Boston. Yeah. So um, they have a long history of sponsoring very kind of entrepreneurial biotechs, meaning I think that because they're smaller, they're not, um, they're not third rock. They're not um, Atlas. Yeah. Atlas, right? They do things surgically in the sense of you know I don't know three to five companies a year maybe that they're all in, uh, but they their their mo is to is set it, it up. A third rock model though. Maybe? Well, it's really what their mo is to set it up and then essentially hire the management team and say, okay, you're empowered. You figure you it out from here, and that really appealed to me because. Not only that they did the messy setup st stuff already, but more that their ongoing engagement with the management team was one of over like ch productive challenge. Um, but you know, the accountability rested with the management team. They weren't the kind of investors that would show up at a meeting and say, "Here's the strategy you're taking." I'd bring the strategy, and they'd debate it, they'd challenge it, they'd share learnings. But they ultimately realized the management team, um, quote, had the decision, right? So I found that to be a very appealing model. And not that, and I can't comment on how others, you know, other VCs necessarily interact with their portfolio companies. But to me, the way Longwood invested with that eye to entrepreneurial management talent felt comfortable. Yeah. And so we continue to enjoy a, a trusted re relationship today. So that got us out of the gate as an immuno oncology company with target stage IP. Literally, we were years from the clinic. Mm -hmm. And I started, so they launched the company in summer 2019. I joined in December of 2019. I moved to Boston. Um, and, you know, three months later, the pandemic hits. And, um, you know, and I also had gotten my arms around the IP. And I realized with the funding environment, you know, the immuno-oncology alone pipeline wasn't going to get us to a value inflection point in time. So we had to do modality expansion. And that's where the ADCs came into play. The antibody drug conjugates came into play because that was a nice adjacency to IO therapy. Yeah. And so we started scouring. This was early 2020. We started scouring the landscape for ADCs. Bayer was spinning some out. Pfizer was spinning some out. There were ADCs in China. And in a very fortunate um twist of timing and luck and good fortune, you know, Pfizer had called me up and said, Hey, we're thinking of spinning these ADCs out the way you did Springworks. Can you, can we chat on lessons learned on this? And our meeting for that was set up for March 12th of 2020. 
And they called and said, don't come to headquarters, you know, because the pandemic was just starting and things were start shutting down iteratively, right, in different cities. So we canceled our meeting. And then the next week we got on Zoom and the world had changed. And Pfizer, you know, Pfizer said, well, hmm, maybe we should think about spinning it into an existing team instead of starting another company in the middle of the pandemic. And so that's how we got the ADC technology from Pfizer. Story. Yeah. So that's it was, story. And, and that formed the founding, that essentially formed the IP that was the foundation of our Series B and our IPO because the IO technology was just not far enough along for investors yeah. to put in Series B and eventually IPO money. But the ADC technology from Pfizer was close to the clinic. And in that 2021 period in biotech, as we all know, it was sort of a frothy, you know, expansive, of, um, more uh, expansive use of capital at that time into preclinical companies. We were able to get financed, you know, with that mixed pipeline of ADC and IO. Um, and we raised 320 million in 20, 2021. Oh, congratulations. That's huge. Thank you. Yeah, we feel very fortunate. Um, very fortunate. It was almost like the IP, our IPO was October of 2021, so fourth quarter, and you could start to feel the sector changing a little bit, but not really. More in retrospect, we look at it and we say, oh, those things that were happening were a sign, but but at the moment, it still felt very, you know, exuberant. And um, and uh, I just remember the sensation, the feeling of like, it's almost like being the last person out of the movie theater that's on fire, like we we got our funding in <laughs> and then the funding market seized up, you know, for 2022. So we were really fortunate to be able to do that. Um, and so now we're progressing a dual modality IO and ADC um, company. Um, you have so, two clinical assets at this point, right? Yes, we have two clinical assets and we actually had announced just um, a couple of weeks ago, just recently, that we're acquiring a very small immuno-oncology company called Apexogen. Yeah. And they have a phase two clinical asset, a CD40 agonist. Um, so that's an IO therapy yeah. that we're bringing in. And when that, so when that deal closes, hopefully later this summer is the expect, expected timeline, we'll have a third clinical asset. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting. You spent time in big pharma. You've gone into the startup space. There's a lot you've done in this, in this, in the biotech space, Laura. It's it's fun to learn about you know your your career path. Um, but what what advice do you have if you could give some advice to a, a young budding biotech entrepreneur? Um, yeah. What would it be? Would it be run for the hills or do you have some actual constructive <laughs> advice? <laughs> I, hopefully I have advice. We'll see if it's constructive, but <laughs> I think that, you know, what I love about our, our industry is the passion and enthusiasm that people have, right? And scientists and business people alike. And because the, the, the odds that we all face are daunting if we really think about them, right? And so that passion and enthusiasm propels through a lot of that. And I, 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 I encourage people to protect that because it's like that naivete, that ignorance we were talking about is that passion, right? And, and when you get more learned about how things work, you have to protect that passion that it doesn't get, you know, dissipated by, you know, low odds of success or, you know, marketing or some of these, you know, things you need to do that maybe are adjacent to what your core reason or mission is. So there's, there's that it's sort of protect the passion at all costs. But I also think um, one of the things we're very deliberate about at Pixis is, 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 is hiring gray hair. Um, some of us diet or color it covered up. <laughs> I've got plenty of gray hair. As you can see. Yeah. <laughs> It's, I think our, our sector, I think is one of the few, maybe the only one really, if you think across sectors that values and rewards experience, because I think drug development is an apprenticeship model, just like medicine. You, you could be the smartest person in the world and the most brilliant scientist. It doesn't mean you know how to put a document together for the FDA. You know, it doesn't mean you know how to pitch investors on what they care about. You have to learn those things, right? right Somebody has to grant. teach you. Yeah. yeah, right in an NIH grant. Somebody has to teach you all of those things. So I think 
maybe the second thing I would advise people, and I think I was very fortunate to have a number of mentors along the way um, in each of these steps that guided me, um, is for people to find those mentors to apprentice under and be okay if you're this brilliant scientist that maybe you're not the CEO, your company and your science is going to be better off in the hands of an experienced CEO, and you play a very valuable role in your scientific or business corridor, depending how you founded the company, where you're learning and apprenticing under that person. And then maybe the next one, you're, you're doing it at another level. Like, it's okay to kind of have a, ste a stepwise um, career as an, as an entrepreneur in biotech, whereas I think our models in tech, you know, you see a a 27 year old CEO because they're brilliant and they have a great, a great idea, but that industry, you can do that because their cycle time is so much faster or their capital expenditure is so much lower. And there's not the regulatory burdens above them that we have where you have to you know learn things and you just can't substitute for the amount of time it takes to learn it. So those are kind of the two. And we very much hire um, highly experienced people at Pixis. And one of our dreams when we, you know, as we hopefully get good data and, and have a durable company over time. And when, one of our dreams is to sort of think about how can we create a pipeline of talent and an apprenticeship model for young drug developers in any discipline. Yeah. It's almost like the tagline of operators training operators, yeah. you know, because like, in in pharma, that's a natural apprenticeship model. You come into a big place like Pfizer or Merck, you go into a function and there's people above you that teach you. In biotech, you might come in and be the only person in that function. So where are you going to learn it? Um, and so one of the ideas we just have is like how, as we scale, are there ways that we can hire sort of younger people in and teach them some of these disciplines and the, almost like a two-year program, like an investment bank or something. Um, but we have to be a lot bigger and more successful than where we are now before we can implement something like that. But that is something I think the industry would benefit from because we don't suffer for lack of creativity or new ideas. I think we're stifled by lack of maybe ex certain experiences in the management of some of these companies, I mean, if there's what a thousand biotechs, how can every C C level person have all those experiences? They learn while they're going. So if there's a way to solve that, I think that that could be helpful. So I'd encourage entrepreneurs to look for those mentorship and apprenticeship opportunities because that will make them that much stronger and effective. I love that, and um, you know, I your your critical literature and your your philosophy side of you came out as you as you talked about protecting the passion i loved that <laughs> uh, yeah so protecting the passion and checking your ego essentially so that you can be mentored because yeah this is an industry where mentors really are quite valuable i, I agree with totally. both of those. great totally. advice yeah. well you know one of our corporate values that we worked on with the team I, it's my favorite is it's it's called patience over ego and what we mean by that, right, is, you know, everything that you do should be with the eye to the patient impact, not like your own self. So, you know, if you even think about things like in a meeting, if somebody gets frustrated at somebody else or feels like they're talked over, that's your ego speaking. Maybe the talking over is because somebody had something important to say that's better for the clinical trial design. So if you can master this concept of patient over ego, and collectively as an organization, we can be incredibly powerful. And, and I think like it, it even, it, it's funny, one of our assistants said the way she thinks of it is when she schedules a meeting, who is the, what's the topic and who's the most important person to be there. And a lot of times it's not me. So they shouldn't schedule or gymnastics the calendar around the CEO's calendar because that's actually, I'm not the most important person in that meeting. And I love that she figured that out instinctively by understanding the value as opposed to me saying, you know, don't rearrange it just because of me, you know, it was internalized why that was important. And that leads to good decision-making because that's, you know, intrinsic in the person. Well, and that's good leadership too, because you're, you're creating that culture. So I think that's a, a, a kudos to you. Oh, thank you. We've got an amazing team and, and I think they're just so passionate and committed to what we're trying to do for patients and, you know, our data will start to come out hopefully end of this year, early next on the on the two programs that we have. Um, when we close the merger, we have, you know, data that's coming over and we're looking forward to kind of trolling through that and 
figuring out what the next stage is for that asset. So it's a lot of things to be excited about and, and the culture and the people, as you know, it's everything because great science can't, can't go anywhere if you don't have an amazing committed team to, to escort it. Yeah, no doubt. That's, that's so true. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always fun to talk to people like you, Laura. Thank you for your time and congratulations on all of your successes. And we'll be watching Pixis uh, and uh, excited to see, you know, what's coming next. Yeah, this was great, Ryan. I really appreciate the the chat and the time to share the story and just getting to to meet you and know you as well. I think there's a lot of common common yeah. philosophies and experiences that we've had. So this is always fun to have the chance to, to compare notes. Well, best of luck. I look forward to staying in touch. And I as well. Okay, Laura. Take All right, care. you too. Take, Take care. Bye. Thank you.